Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Israel Unplugged. This is Josh Wan from Yerushalayim Mira Kodesh, and I'm here with my co-host, Rabbi Moshe Lichtman from Beit Shemesh. Yes, yes. Moshe, are you there? Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you just fine. This is uh, oh, Israel good. Unplugged, okay. and this is where you get the unadulterated facts of where we're holding in the redemptive process, focusing primarily on the ingathering of the exiles. Today we have a special show, as always, a show that's going to include... Hopefully, the interview that we were and uh, trying to have last uh, week with uh, Michael Freund, a very exciting interview. Unfortunately, there were some technical difficulties last week. We hope to have him on this week. Uh, we hope to have some very exciting Divrei Torah, perhaps about the Parsha. And, uh, and I think this is a time also to give some plugs uh, for uh, our websites uh, Rabbi Moshe Lichtman has a website where he has uh, translated and written numerous books, and they are for sale on Toratzion, T-O-R-A-T-Z-I-O-N dot com. And uh, I have a website also that's called bringthemhome.org.il. Uh, it could also be seen on the other domains, which is which are uh, it's time to leave dot com and israeltorah.org. All of those lead to the same place. It is a website which is full of information about uh, the Aliyah process, about why one should come and make Aliyah, why it's an imperative today for Jews to get up and to move to the Holy Land. Uh, there are videos there. There are blogs. There are th- This show is sponsored, as well as uh, my daily podcast, uh, we have so much exciting stuff over there. We have lots of information, and uh, we encourage you to go there. There's a YouTube channel as well, which is Israel Torah, uh, youtube.com slash Israel Torah. We encourage everybody to go there and to uh, sign up to press the button that uh, that uh, subscribes and the bell that allows you to, to get notified when there is a new video on and, uh, and we hope that you would join us. Uh, this is going to be a very exciting so- show again with uh, Rabbi Moshe Lichtman and with Michael Freund. See you soon. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Okay, welcome back to Israel Unplugged. As we promised you, we have a special guest today, Michael Freund. We we introduced him a little bit last week, but we'll do so again very quickly. Michael Freund is the founder and chairman of Shave Israel, a Jerusalem-based group that works closely with Israel's chief rabbinate and reaches out to Nidhe Israel, that means lost tribes of Israel, and other far-flung Jewish communities. He is also a uh, correspondent, a syndicated columnist for the Jerusalem Post, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're not going to take the time to go back over all of the details. Let's uh, get right into our conversation with Michael. Hello, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. It's great to be with you both. Oh, thank you. Okay, so your organization, Shave Israel, um, basically searches out and helps, assists, um, Nidche Israel, as we said, lost tribes of Israel come back to Judaism and also to the land of Israel. Can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. Uh, I founded Shaveh uh, almost 20 years ago. 
uh, after I, um, I made Aliyah in 1995 from New York, and when Benjamin Netanyahu was elected prime minister the first time around in 1996, I worked for him in the prime minister's office. And it was there uh, in the spring of 1997 that a, uh, a letter arrived from a community in northeastern India called the B'nai Menashe, uh, the descendants of the tribe of Manasseh, one of the ten lost tribes of Israel, asking to uh to come back to uh to the land of their ancestors and um one thing led to another and i became involved in helping the community to come on aliyah in large numbers and in 1999 when mr netanyahu left office um i um i then began thinking more broadly about this issue of descendants of israel and descendants of jews and I began reading about different phenomena, and I simply got on the plane and started visiting uh, all these various places. And I saw that there are many, uh, many descendants of Jews out there who still have a strong sense of Jewish consciousness and connection, but no one was really doing anything to reach out to them. And I, I believed then, and I believe today, that that is a strategic mistake, and that uh, we have an obligation towards these people to try and uh, be makare of them, to try and draw them closer uh, to their roots. Wow. So, so are B'nai Menashe the only group that uh, uh, that you have helped so far come back to Israel, or are there other tribes out there that uh, that, that you can speak about? Well, we've been blessed to bring more than four thousand uh, B'nai Menashe on Aliyah over the years. And with God's help, in the coming year, we're going to bring uh, a sizable number as well. There are still 6,500 of them in India, all of whom are waiting to, uh, to make Aliyah. Um, but we also work with a variety of other communities around the world, such as the Chinese Jews of Kaifeng in China, who are the descendants of the, uh, the, the Spartac Jewish community that existed there since the 7th or the 8th century, uh, we've brought about 20 young Chinese Jews uh, on Aliyah thus far. And um, throughout the Spanish and Portuguese-speaking world, uh, we work with the um, historians refer to them as Moranos, but we prefer the Hebrew term B'nai Anusim, uh, the, the descendants of those who were coerced. Uh, these are people whose ancestors were Spanish and Portuguese Jews who were forcibly converted to Catholicism, beginning in the 14th century, and then they were hunted down viciously by the Inquisition. Uh, but nonetheless, many continued uh, with great bravery and persistence. Uh, many continued to practice Judaism down through the generations. And in recent years, we're seeing an, a growing number of them who are looking to, uh, to reconnect with our people. And I feel that we have a, um, a historical responsibility, a moral responsibility, and a religious responsibility uh, to embrace these people and welcome them back. Their ancestors were, were kidnapped from us. They were taken from us against their will. And yet they somehow clung to a sense of Jewish identity. Uh, so now that many of them are knocking on our collective door, asking to be allowed in, um, I don't see how we can possibly slam the door in their faces. I learned something today which was I found fascinating, and I'm sure that uh, you will as well. Um, there's a whole question. It's, it's the week after Thanksgiving, and there's a whole question about the kashrut, the, the kosher status of a turkey. And there are a number of sources, early sources, that actually said that they are trusting turkey to be allowed let's give some background if you don't have a tradition for turkey or for any for a bird to be kosher then it's questionable whether that that uh, that bird can be uh, called kosher and uh, since the the turkey was only discovered in you know around 1492 in, in in america and then later on it was brought to europe there's a question as to whether turkey is kosher and there's some authorities that say uh, it, that one cannot eat it most uh, do eat it today uh, but there were early sources that actually said that we are relying on the uh, Native Americans, the Indians. Um, and there's another source that say the people in India uh, that ate turkey and therefore we're relying on them as a Masora, as a tradition to eat that bird. Have you ever heard that? That is fascinating because uh, we know that once the New World was discovered, um, there were quite a number of prominent Jewish and Christian theologians 
who wrote about their belief that the American Indians or the, the Native Americans uh, were possibly descendants of the Lost Tribe of Israel. Uh, Rabbi ben- Menashe ben Yisrael of Amsterdam, who lived in the 17th century, um, he wrote in one of his works about how, based on certain customs that uh, some of the Native Americans were practicing, uh, he believed that they were, in fact, descendants of Israel. Uh, so that, that is a very interesting uh, piece of the puzzle there. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. So, uh, you know, I, I assume these people, although, as you said, they have you know, certain Jewish customs that they keep, but it also says that you, uh, you work closely with the, the Israeli rabbinate. So I assume that they require a conversion. Is that correct? Uh, yes, in mo- in most cases, uh, that is the case. That is correct. Uh, in other words, um, the Bnei Menashe, when they make Aliyah, they all undergo conversion by Israel's chief rabbinate, uh, as do the Chinese Jews. Um, and uh, the advantage of that is, of course, that it removes any possible doubts about their personal status, and it means that no one can question uh, their Jewish authenticity. Right. Is that obligatory right. when they come over? Because I, I know I, I, with the, when it comes to the Ethiopians, I'm not sure that everyone went through what they call a Gior Bechumra, whether they all, they, they, do they have an option of not doing that, of opting out? Uh, no, because the, uh, the Bnei Menashe and the Chinese Jews, neither of them fall under the criteria of Israel's uh, Chok HaShvut, the Law of Return. The Law of Return goes back two generations. Anyone with a Jewish grandparent uh, has the right to immigrate to Israel, e- even if they are not themselves Jewish. Um, but uh, the the connection of the Bnei Menashe and the Chinese Jews uh, to uh, goes back much further than two generations. So um, in order for them to be able to come to Israel, the uh, the government and the rabbinate requires them to go through the conversion. Before, the, before they come on Aliyah? Uh, no, once they arrive. In other words, once they come they here and they study, um, they study here and uh, go through the process here. Okay, Michael, we all we have three minutes left. So, so besides the lost tribes of Israel, I know you're also involved. I know very personally, you're also involved in trying to bring back uh, the known Jews, the ones in uh, New York and uh, England and other places. And that's what uh, pushed you to write and to uh, sponsor the book, A Drop in the Ocean. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? What made you uh, uh, initiate that project? Well, we all, we've seen how in recent years uh, there's been growing popularity of various daily study programs, um, ranging from the Daf Yomi, the daily study of a page of Talmud, to um, the daily study of uh, the Rambam, of the works of Maimonides, and others. And it occurred to me that uh, there was no similar program that I was aware of uh, regarding um the importance of the land of Israel and the importance of living in uh, the land of Israel. Uh, so I, I came up with the idea to create a, um, uh, a daily study program along those lines, and I approached uh, you, Rabbi Moshe, as you know, and um, uh, the result was uh, the book, a, a Drop in the Ocean, which is uh, 365 uh, sources, uh, Jewish sources, which were lovingly and meticulously collected by you, and um, it is, a, uh, I think, a very powerful compendium for anyone who takes uh, Jewish history and Jewish destiny seriously, for anyone who takes halakha seriously, who takes Jewish law seriously. Um, it's worth a look, because um, we might think that uh, we, we all know everything that's needed to know about Eretz Israel, about the land of Israel, but that is very far from the case. And as the name of the book implies, um, even if one were to sit and spend years uh, reading only about Eretz Israel uh, and its importance, uh, the best they could hope to cover is merely a drop in the ocean. Uh, so I would, I would encourage your listeners uh, to uh, to consider obtaining the book and uh, right not just and, and let, let me say it I know we have very little time left part of their daily regimen. 
Right. The, rate, the way to get it is actually through your website, uh, uh, ShaveIsrael. What is it? org or dot com. Uh, it's uh, www. Shave, S H A V E I uh, Shave. org. Okay, and there you can order the book. Uh, so, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, we have to call it. Uh, you know, we have to go to go to the sponsors. Thank you so much, and continue luck in everything that you do. Thanks, and it's Parsha by Yishlach this week when Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our patriarch, returns to the land of Israel after living in exile. So, uh, God willing, uh, his all of his descendants. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar, she's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Welcome back to Israel Unplugged. This is Josh Wander, and uh, thank you for staying with us. We were so happy that we got a hold and was it, were able to connect with Michael Freund this time. And uh, I have a clip for you, Rabbi Moshe Lichtman, um, that I took off the Internet. It's a, uh, from a podcast by a Rabbi, um, a Rabbi Shimon Jacobson. He's the brother of Y.Y. Jacobson, if you if you know the family. I've heard that, uh, he's yeah. He's a prominent, uh, prominent mashpia in the Chabad community, a prominent rabbi in the community, and he's asked questions uh, that he, on his podcast, he's, people write in to him, and they ask him different questions in, in Torah philosophy, and uh, this week, or last week, actually, they asked him about the idea of moving to Israel in these troubled times, and I'd like to play it and hear your response. <laughs> question which is I guess around everything going on here so on right should we all make aliyah to Israel now before the next American civil war begins I chuckle not because I find it a funny question I just uh, you know envisioning it so there are a few people actually that feel that way based on the elections I know some people are, are going to be moving to Israel I think the criteria for moving to Israel goes back to, from the direct guidelines and what are they that if you're not, if you're in a position here in the United States, or wherever in the world, where you're needed for a moisit or something of gedusha, and the community and people are dependent on you, you can't just pick yourself up and leave because you have a shlichus. If, on the other hand, you don't have that, and conditions, whether it's financial or other factors, fit in, it's a soul is a beautiful place. Not just I don't mean beautiful, I mean beruchnis. And there were many people that did move with the Rebbe's bracha. Samach Tzaddik did say, Macher Tzisrael Do, to a who wanted to move. Did, did, did that mean that everybody, you see, the Rebbe told people who asked, and they did move. The Rebbe sent Shluchim to Tzisrael. So it's not for everyone, Macher Tzisrael Do, but there's also that concept that we have to transform everything to Tzisrael, because at the end of the day, it's not a geographical thing to be in Tzisrael. In Tzisrael also, we say, because you have to live at Tzisrael, wherever you are. And some people say, which is clearly true, that the Rebbe lived more with Eretz Yisrael than people who lived in Eretz Yisrael. Besides that we dive in that direction, it's saturated the Rebbe's entire being. Eretz Yisrael as the triad of Shlema Sa'aretz and Shlema Sa'atera and Shlema Sa'am. So this is more of an individual decision. I'm not, I don't think anyone can give a Heirah, a Klolis, a general directive. Everybody should move. If you feel that the time has come, whatever reason... By all means, talk to your mashpia, consider it, and if you can do it, do it as, again without compromising anything that you may be responsible for. But next, okay, okay. Hmm, so, what okay. are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? Um, okay, on the one hand, I, I am I am pleasantly surprised that he said, you know, if you're not uh, fulfilling an important uh, tafkid, how do you say, job task. In in Chutzlar, it's outside the land of Israel. That uh, you sh- you know you certainly should consider it. 
I mean, Rav Shechter says the same thing, that someone who, who is involved in chutzlar, it's in, 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 in teaching Torah and, and helping people come become from, become religious, uh, they might not be have an obligation, they might not even be able to. That's one of the reasons Rav Shechter himself doesn't come to Israel, because he's needed as a posek. Now, I don't know if as many people as he's referring to are really needed, as Rav Shechter himself also always says, the uh, cemeteries are filled with ir- irreplaceable people. So, um, you know, on the one hand, I'm pleasantly surprised that he said that. On the other hand, of course, there's, uh, first of all, the, the the very fact that it's not emphasized. It's just something like, yeah, it'd be a nice thing. Like, why not? You know, you should. But, you know, you could also live in America and there's nothing wrong with that either. That obviously goes very much against what I believe in. What about um, Eretz Israel is not a geographic Exactly, location. exactly. That's really the most uh, disturbing part of uh uh, of the of the thing, you know, it it is. Um, I'm not so surprised, you know. You know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but you know, they say that the you know the closest um, religion to Judaism is Chabad, Chabadism, or something like that. You know, so okay, you've, uh, you've offended half of our audience now. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, no, there's no doubt that Chabad has done unbelievable things in this world the, the amount of people that they're makariv you can't take that away from them uh, there's no doubt about it um you know is the rebbe the only poseg in the world i mean he's talking he's talking to chabad hasidim it's like what i say to to samar hasidim samar hasidim should follow their rebbe and chabad hasidim should follow their rebbe the rebbe did not hold that it was that that medinat yisrael was reshit smichat gulateno that the state of israel was the beginning of the of the redemption so i'm not surprised uh, but in terms of everyone else who's not a chabad hasid uh, the rebbe was one of many many opinions and there are many many other opinions that say no it's a like we discussed last week it's a mitzvah del it is a it is a torah based mitzvah even obligation to live in the the land of Israel. So to just say, you know, it's a nice thing if you can, if you if you want to, but you know, you also don't have to. Is is a little bit, you know, is is not. I think uh, what uh, what one should um, consider the uh, the normative halachic uh, halachic decision. Um, I, again, but in terms of that that issue of you know, Israel is not uh, Eretz Yisrael is not a geographical location. I don't even know what to say to that. I mean, it obviously is, and it is true that, you know, you should be a holy person wherever you live. And yeah, maybe it is better to be a holy person outside of the What do you think what he said? They also in Eretz Israel, we say, We say that because there's still not all the Jews, or not all the Jews are back in the land of Israel. plural, galinu, plural, me'artzenu. And, you know, we were also exiled from our land, but we came back. And the majority of the Jews, or, or a large portion of the Jews, have not yet come back. So we still have to say, That would be similar to if someone uh, has nobody sick, no one in his family is sick or anything. But he still says, Why? But he's not sick, because Rafainu refers to all of Am Yisrael. So too, Us as a people. The Jewish people were exiled from our land, and, you know, we're waiting for them to come back. And trust me, when all the Jewish people return to Israel, we will no longer say in in the in that tefillah, in the Musaf uh, um, uh, prayer, we will not say, There will be a different uh, version. It'll be a version based on Geula, based on, on the redemption. Just, so, just for the record, I'm, I'm not as generous as you when it comes to just listen to what your Rebbe says. Um, I think that the only the only is only one person that we are able to listen to and not doubt. Uh, we take everything what he says 100% uh, blanket, and we don't ask any questions. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no other person like that, and, and that ever was or will ever come to the world. And if somebody, if your Rebbe says something which is clearly against the Torah, then you have to question your Rebbe. But uh, you have to know what you. Of course, you have to be on a level to question your Rebbe. But right. uh, but right. but of course, uh, you, your Rebbe cannot say something against the Torah. That is true, a hundred percent. And and obviously, I don't believe that the Satmar are right, and I don't believe that the uh, the Chabad, the Lubavitcher Hasidim are, are are right on this issue either. Um, but I I can't say that I would be able to say to a Satmar Hasid, you know, look into it. Your Rebbe's wrong. You know, he's I, I just you know, I, it's it's not even worth my time. Is, isn't they, that what the Imam Smechad did? 
Yes, but he wouldn't listen to me. This person wouldn't listen to me. He would say, but my Rebbe was the greatest Rebbe that ever lived. And and therefore, you know, he would actually probably spit in my face. He wouldn't, He it would make no sense. So that's what I mean when I say, a summer chassid should listen to the Rebbe. Yes. You, you know, you, you know, know the, fame, the, the story that Rav Nachman Kahana always says that uh, he many years ago was in America and he sat down at a, at a, at a train station on a, at a bench. He saw there was two, two Hasidim sitting there, two Jews, and he sat down next to them. It turns out that they were Satmar Hasidim. And he starts up, uh, starts up a conversation with them. He says to them, he says, Nu, when are you moving to Eretz Israel? So they laughed at him and they said, well, we're going to move as soon as the Mashiach comes and sends us a limo to come pick us up. So Rav Nachman looks at them and says, a limo to pick you up. He says, you know, this says in the Gemara that someone that is, that, that is buried outside of Eretz Yisrael, somebody who's buried outside, is not, is not uh, resurrected, does not get a resurrection. So, they have to roll through and the what ground. they have to do is that they roll through the ground, this terrible punishment in order to come to Eretz Yisrael to be resurrected. So he says, what do you mean to say is that your Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe, has to go through this terrible punishment of rolling through the ground to come to Eretz Yisrael, and you want to be picked up in a limo? So they didn't like that. They got up and left. But anyway, I'm sure they didn't like it. Oh, but, but if you since you already mentioned uh, Rav Nachman Kahana, so you told me beforehand that he he had a, a certain reaction to this uh, this uh, clip that you just played for us. So what did he say? So so he said he tried he tried very hard listening to the clip to try to find something that he agreed with his rabbi, but unfortunately he couldn't find anything. <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he explained, uh, not like our Rebbe says, he explained why, but, but similar to your de Gaulle quote, uh, that all the cemeteries, that the cemeteries are full of uh, the, the irreplaceable people, um, that, that really everybody could say that they're irreplaceable, but in the end, really, the, the, even the leadership needs to get up and move and to be an example to everyone else. No doubt about it. So uh, this actually, what you just brought up, uh, will lead us into the next section. We only have uh, less than a minute, so we'll just introduce it. Um, you know, talking about big rabbis and what they hold and what they say about these issues. So I want to quote for you a few uh, statements, a few quotes from the great Chafetz Chaim, who nobody doubts, as opposed to the, the rabbis we spoke about a few minutes ago, who they were certainly great rabbis, but, you know, they had their followers and they had those who very vehemently disagreed with them. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the, the religious Jewish world who doesn't agree or doesn't hold that the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, was one of the greatest sages of all time, certainly of the last hundred uh, years. And so we're going to see it when we come back. We're going to see some things that he that he said. So stick stick with us. Don't go anywhere. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Political Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul.
Okay, welcome back to Israel Unplugged. As I promised, we're going to speak about the Chafetz Chaim's opinion on some of these issues. Okay, so this week's parsha, we know that it's the uh, uh, the um, fateful meeting of Yaakov and Esav. After twenty years, he meets up again with uh, with Yaakov, with Esav. Yaakov meets with Esav, and. Um, you know, and the rabbis say that there's a lot of things we have to learn from this because, you know, this is this is the classic meeting of Yaakov, the Esau, the Jews, and the non-Jewish world, specifically the Esau, uh, you know, type of non-Jews. And, um, and this relates very much to a very famous story, which is found in, I mean, it's found in my book, I translated it, but... Uh, it's found in a book called Chafetz Chaim Ala Torah. It's a book of uh, Divrei Torah, words of Torah by the Chafetz Chaim on the Parsha. So it tells us the following story, and it is absolutely shocking. In 1933, when Hitler Yamach Shemot came to power in Germany, now, one, by the way, this was also the Chafetz Chaim's last year of life. He died in 1933. So when he came to power, one of the heads of the Radin Yeshiva, which is where the Chafetz Chaim, that was the Chafetz Chaim's Yeshiva, one of the heads of the Yeshiva asked the Chafetz Chaim about the fate of the Jews. After all, the wicked one, meaning Hitler, announced his goal to annihilate the Jewish people. He didn't try to hide it. He said, when I come to power, I'm going to kill all the Jews. So the Chafetz Chaim answered, he shall not succeed. No one has ever succeeded in destroying our nation in the lands of our dispersion. And the, fir- the verse in this week's parasha says explicitly, Im yavo Esav el If Esav comes to one camp and smites it, lifleta, then the remaining camp will escape. In other words, the Chafiz Chaim was not saying that Hitler will not be somewhat successful in carrying out his evil plans. But he will definitely not be successful in totally wiping out the Jewish people. Because Yaakov split, Jacob split the Jewish people into two specifically for that reason. Just in case Esau kills one of the groups, the other group will be able to escape. So the person who was asking the Chafetz Chaim um, this question, understood that the danger was imminent, and he continued to ask innocently. So if the pr- oppressor succeeds in destroying a portion of the Jewish people, God forbid, who will be the remaining camp that will escape? You, Chafetz Chaim, are saying that there will be a, a, a remnant of the Jewish people. Well, who's gonna, who is it going to be? Said the Chafetz Chaim, this too is stated explicitly in scriptures, and it happens to be the Haftorah, right? The portion from the prophets that we read on this week's parsha. It says, "Uvahar Zion Tiepleta." On Mount Zion, there will be a remnant. In other words, the Chavetz Chaim was saying, Hitler might be successful in destroying one camp of the Jewish people, i.e., the European camp, but there will be a remnant. Where? Bahar Zion on Mount Zion. The questioner left the Chafetz Chaim's presence completely shaken and agitated over the imminent destruction of European Jewry, yet he felt confident that our holy land would be saved. This, the Chafetz Chaim wrote, in 1933, or said in 1933, before anyone knew what was going to happen, before anyone knew if Hitler would be successful or what would happen afterwards. And we all know the end of the story. Hitler really did destroy one of the camps of, of the Jewish people. But the other camp did success, did, did uh, survive. And what is that camp? The state of Israel. What happened immediately, historically speaking, three years after the, the end of the Holocaust, what happened? The state of Israel was established. This became the, the, the safe haven for the Jewish people throughout the world, the the, the the uh, survivors of the Holocaust, many came to Israel. Um, many Jews, or almost all the Jews from the uh, the Arab lands where they were being persecuted also, um, escaped to the land of Israel. And this has become now the greatest, for sure, um, Jewish community in the world. 
And this is exactly what the Chafetz Chaim said. The and Chafetz that which ha- verse yeah. is written on the on the on the wall outside of the Panovich Yeshiva, which is not a Zionist Yeshiva, but yeah. exactly this pasuk speaking about that being that Sion is going to be the Sheret Tapleta. What I find amazing, of Moshe, is that people use this exact reasoning for not coming to Israel. I they never say, heard that. What does that mean? <laughs> sure, they say since you since we have to have Shtei Machanos. And there's one in Eretz Yisrael. What happens if Eretz Yisrael gets destroyed? Chas v'shalom. So we have to have another machina outside of Eretz Yisrael to make sure that the Jewish people will always survive. Wow. Okay. So um, you just you just reminded me of something from many many years ago. I had a rebbe who was really one of my one of my my real mentors who I, I think really changed my life and unfortunately passed away recently of a terrible disease and uh, I, I actually didn't even know about it and it, and I found out about it uh, by the way and I was very, very upset about it, Rav Boaz Alivi. And um, Rav Boaz, was, so he spent some time in America. He's total Israeli, but he went to America to try to do some kiruva, try to do some, uh, you know, outreach and bring Jews to Israel. And during one of the years that he was there, so he was involved in, in various different things. So there was some someone who once put on a play at one of these seminars. He came to the seminars which uh, Yeshiva University did for our less religious uh, children in order to give them a taste of Shabbos. If you've ever been to one of those seminars, there were amazing, uh, amazing educational programs. So he was on one of them. And they did this program called The Last Jew. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's, it's a very powerful, powerful um, uh, presentation, right, where there's this museum and this one Jew left and people come to see it, which, by the way, unfortunately, <laughs> is what Hitler wanted. Hitler wanted, you know, that he, in, in Prague, he had yes, was plans... He had plans to make a museum of the Jewish of the Jewish Not people. They, they made a museum. They, they made. Did. I know. I know. All right, right, right. But I mean, he had plans that that would be the only remnant, and of course, it wasn't. Um, so, so this play, this it, it's really for irreligious kids to show them that you know we have to marry Jewish and we have to. It's it's important to stay Jewish, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, everyone thought it was so amazing and so powerful and inspirational. And then Rav Boaz Levi, who was my Rebbe the year before in Israel, he he said he was very agitated and very upset about it. And we asked what was wrong. He said, it's it's unconceivable to even think about the fact that there should be such a thing as there's no Jewish people left. It's impossible. It's ridiculous. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God has promised, the, promised us that the Jewish people will continue and will survive. So this person who was saying these people you're telling me are saying there's two camps and what happens if the Jewish people in Israel, you know, get uh, just, you know, all get destroyed. So there has to be another camp in America or other places. Why do you think after 2000 years, God brought the Jewish people back to the land of Israel and built up the state of Israel to such a a wondrous uh, degree? We're one of the greatest nations in the world, according to everybody. Everyone knows we're the one of the most advanced and uh, uh, you know, most economically viable, et cetera, et cetera, places in the world. And you're going to tell me that God did that all as a sort of the way I like putting it as a fake out breakout, you know, like, you know, a color war. Oh, it's a fake out. You know, it's not really the start of color war. You know, it's a fake out. This was all just a joke. God's just joking with us. You really think that God brought us back to the land of Israel, brought back almost half or maybe even more than half of the Jewish people to the land of Israel in order to just let it all peter out, let us all be destroyed, and then the the American Jews are going to be the, the, the ones that are going to be uh, the, the last camp that remains? I mean, really? You really think that that's what's going to happen? The fact that this is a fulfillment of so many different prophecies, that doesn't bother you? That No, the American Jewry, that's what's, gonna, that's what's going to remain. And, and history hasn't taught us that every single exile ends in the same way where the Jew, where where the Jewish people are kicked out or or worse of their exiles and but we know that once the Jewish people return to Eretz Israel there will never be a third exile so that is so ridiculous i don't even know how to what to do with myself <laughs> okay so um so this is the Chafetz Chaim. i want to read you one more just because we have very little time left 
the Chafetz Chaim, uh, there's a book called Mechtevei Chafetz Chaim, by the son of the Chafetz Chaim, and he tells the following story. I remember how in 1890, 1891, when they began to expel our Jewish brethren from Moscow, a great movement arose to return to our Holy Land. The deportees by, listen to this number, the hundreds and thousands hastened to find refuge in our forefathers' land. They bought land there, planted vineyards, and established colonies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on, and he says, at that time, in other words, the beginning of the Zionist movement, at that time, I received a letter from my father in which he brought to my attention the great awakening that was sweeping through all corners of our nation to ascend to the land. And he estimated, this is the line, the Chafetz Chaim in this letter to his son said, he estimates that the times in which we are living are the times of the footsteps of Mashiach and that Hashem has remembered his people. And he said it is possible that the ingathering of the exiles which precedes, comes before Mashiach's arrival, has begun. And that if we could, we should buy land and go up to Eretz Yisrael. Now, if the Chafetz Chaim said that because hundreds and possibly thousands of Jews were starting to move from Moscow because they were being kicked out, they were moving to, to, to Eretz Yisrael, he called that possibly the beginning of the Kibbutz Galiot, right? What are we to say today when almost half the Jewish people live here? Do you think the Chafetz Chaim would even have a doubt that this is actually Kibbutz Galiot, the ingathering of the exiles? And with that, I will leave you because we have run out of time. Next time, please be with us again next week. Same time, same channel. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips. With scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Doris from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 